Welcome to the new Cannabis and Coffee Conversations podcast brought to you by the Gantactivist.com magazine. Each week we'll bring you special guests spanning the spectrum of the burgeoning cannabis industry. I, I've been wanting to speak with you for a while because I do, I find your, your journey somewhat interesting. Um, not that, well, of course, cannabis is a, is a real, well, legal cannabis is a relatively new industry. Um, and, you know, by just by proxy, there will be uh, people coming in from other industries. But your, your, um, your, your, your history um, is in, is in, is in finance. Am I correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I spent a bunch, yeah. So I spent over a decade at, at JP Morgan um, in from the Silicon Valley, though. So I was at a startup in Silicon mm-hmm. Valley. JP Morgan acquired the startup I was at, and I just was folded into the financial world at that point. I didn't really um, you know, know a lot about payments. It was brand new to me at the time. I had a business degree, but ultimately going into a big bank was a whole new learning for me. Uh, but spending 10, 11 years at JP Morgan, I, I learned a lot. And now I, you know, it's, it's a passion of mine. Okay. And, and then, and then you, then you went from JP Morgan and you went to a, a smaller startup, FinTech startup. Um, mm-hmm. that wasn't exactly the most positive experience. So you want to share that a little bit? That yeah, might have inspired. Well, well it sorry, did. Yeah, it did inspire. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it was, I, I say, not that I, I wouldn't say it wasn't a positive experience because some of the, you know, some of the, the cha- most challenging times and and I've seen in my life have, have resulted in some of the best things. So right. I, I take a lot of those challenges and you can turn them into very positive experiences because you learn so much from them. So I would say going, leaving a big bank and going into the startup world, I, I learned that not all businesses operate like a JP Morgan. And that's, that's why JP Morgan is what it is today. Okay. Um, but then I could take my experience and translate that and into a smaller business and help them grow rapidly and that's and that's what happened so despite kind of the external piece of of you know a small startup operations from a I was able to grow that business very rapidly and that was an inspiration of mine to start my own business because I realized I had the tools in my toolbox to be successful out on my own and you know given that experience I wanted to go and be on my own Um, and that's how Payria was started. Um, all right, fair enough. Do you think you could have made the transition if you went straight from JP Morgan to Perio or you needed that little startup experience? Exactly. Kind of, yeah, know. I needed that motivation because I don't I didn't know I didn't realize at the time the value that JP Morgan gave me into, you know, a fast a startup world. JP Morgan was just my way of, of life for so long and the way I operated on a professional basis. I it's, it's almost like if you grew up in California and this happened to me, you grow up in this California bubble and then you go to college on the East Coast, which is what I did, you know, you're almost set to think the whole world is like California and architecture and people and everything. And then you go out to um, New York and I did this from experience and people are everyone, people are different. Pace of life is different. Even the buildings look different. The weather's different. And you realize, oh, wow, I was in this bubble for so long. I think that's kind of how JP Morgan was where I was in this bubble and thought the, you know, all businesses operated that way and realized very quickly that they didn't, but the bubble I was in was the best one to be in. I, I would say the Harvard of, I always say that's the Harvard of education of payments, you know? So, yeah. That, that interesting trend is people are starting out working remotely and then going into the professional world and that, that there's, there's a, a, a culture shock when, when that actually happens. Um, but when you, when you, so what, what was it, what was the transition like going from JP Morgan? You say that's, that's the Harvard of business. Um, how was that transitioning to a smaller, a small business? It was it was great because a lot of the all of my learnings and processes I had in place there, which was just the way of doing business, I, translating that, um, bringing those to a startup really helps them grow, you know, get organized and grow quickly. So it the transition was wonderful. I, I love working in the sm- smaller business, fast paced startup environment. So taking a lot of the processes and bringing it into a business where you have more control and you're not one of, I think they have 80,000 employees, but you're one of, you know, 
25, 30 employees, you can make a bigger impact with the knowledge that you brought, bring from a big company. And I was going to actually ask exactly that question, the size of the company difference, um, what that, what that, what that looks like. So then, all right. So then you, you applied these skills and then, and now you're in, in, and then you decided to apply them to the cannabis space or to alternative medicine or plant medicine space. Why that transition? That's, that's, I mean, yeah, please. Yeah. So I was part of cannabis or been in the cannabis industry since 2010. So it's been a long, a long time out here in California. Um, you got to see the industry go from, you know, not, you know, not being seen as a, a legal selling to medical and, you know, recreational, obviously. So you see the transition of the industry when it's a lot of home growers. Now it gets to where there's dispensaries, et cetera. Um, so it's always been, you know, an industry that I've looked at and seen change. It wasn't necessarily where I saw myself going, you know, when I started at JP Morgan or back in 2010, for example, but okay. given the opportunity to start a business and figure out where I wanted to focus on CBD came to mind first. And very quickly after speaking with retailers, I, we found the, the gap and the need for cannabis payments. CBD is federally legal, so it's much easier to find a payment solution in that space, although it is still hard, but it's a lot easier than finding a payment solution in cannabis. So it was the constant feedback was, hey, we already have a processor for CBD, but do you have do you know anything about cannabis? And so it quickly helped kind of guide our company to focus in on finding the right solutions, compliant solutions for cannabis. So you know, is with the same, with a vision in mind of starting a, a, a solution that's focusing in on the health and wellness industries. And then we just listen to what our customers or our prospects needed and, and almost pivoted in that direction. Um, all right. What, what kind of pain points were they, were they identifying? Just reliability. A lot of times they would start up and then get shut down. Um, cost is a big pain point. Um, connectivity, but it's mainly reliability and and cost. Um, a lot of times, uh, providers would charge double, triple what they should um, because they knew these companies were desperate to find a solution. And we came in and and charge fair rates um, and save can save you know companies a lot of money. So right, right. it's it's just it's a it's a hard industry to be in, especially from a merchant standpoint especially if you don't know a lot about payments or what you should be charged and so that's where we come in and we want to be able to consult with our customers or our prospects and help them find a solution that fits their needs best um right on that that brings up actually two questions but the first one was is that you you i have also seen some some reporting that you said you wanted to add bring a feminine touch to the to payment processing in the cannabis space w what does that entail I, i'm assuming that it's a part of this fairness so what, what what's what's the feminine touch that you're bringing mm -hmm. well in 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 payments and in fintech and in cannabis female leadership is lacking um when i was at the startup after leaving JP Morgan, I was the only female in the entire C-suite and board. And I wanted to, you know, part of starting my own company was also making a change and making an impact on female leadership when, you know, and, and being a CEO, I have the opportunity to do that. Uh, right. And so we launched with, um, you know, that in mind. So we, do support or, or employ a lot of stay at home moms. We have a very flexible schedule so they can, you know, support their kids and their when they need to, et cetera. And uh, a feminine touch, meaning we wanted to not be payment sometimes seems very old, uh, very stodgy. And we wanted to come in with a fresh new look on payments as well and, and just be more approachable. Uh, when it comes to some, you know, an industry or a product that, um, you know, merchants might shy away from. So payments tend to be the second or third most expensive, you know, biggest expense in small businesses. And so how do you, how do you take something that small businesses don't really like to talk about or have poor experience and make them feel comfortable reaching out and, and feeling like they have a team behind them to support them. So that's what I meant by feminine touch. 
right. All right. That that works. That works right on. Yeah. Well, then, but then, no, that that leads that brings up to be a bit. Well, that leads perfectly to the next question, which would be, which would be. Um, I'm sure that a lot of these people have had these pain points because of because of the issue with banking. How have you helped mitigate, or how do you mitigate the, that relationship with banks? Because um, I do know that even recently, Mastercard, I think it was, to you know, kind of see some desist from cannabis companies and so on. How how do you how do you handle that that, that, that kind of situation, that relationship, I guess. So is we have always stuck to finding compliant solutions in the market and payment brands or banks, there are ways to process payments and there are banks that support this industry. It just, as long as you're following all the rules and regulations and the guidelines and checking all of the boxes, um, that's those are the products we bring to market. There are products out there that process payments or or do you know things in in a non-compliant or illegal manner and we don't touch that in any means so if it's a solution we bring to market it's fully compliant it a lot of times there's different funds flow or it's outside of the box and and in many cases from an outsider looking in um, if you don't really understand the nuances of the technology behind the scenes it's hard to be able to point is this legal or illegal or are they doing something but you know for us it's how do we navigate it it's all a case-by-case -case basis and you just have to be able to you know stand behind the products that you bring to the the table or the solutions you bring to the table and we do oh, but that that also puts a lot of faith in the in your customer um you know in them remaining compliant and them actually you know charging what they say is actually on the menu I, I, just do you is how, how do you mitigate that? I mean, what, what's the screening process like? I guess we'll start with that. With our customers or the yeah. technologies? With, with the customers. I'm talking like the dispensary owners and um, farmers and stuff like that. Cause they're, you know, they, they might be tempted to do <laughs> not so, you know, not so legal so things. So <laughs> we, 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 there's no screening process. Any customer, any customer, any dispensary, farmer, business that wants to work with us, we would love to work with them because we know that when, they partner with us we find a safe and compliant place to you know way to help them so if they're doing business in different fashion before they come to the table or continue to do have partners that we don't align with that's that's out of our ecosystem but all i know is so we have we love to help anyone in in the in, in these industries because we know it's a feel good it's a great feeling when they come on board. We know we place them in a safe and secure spot. Well, tell me, what is the onboarding process like? Just explain that a little bit. Uh, it just depends on the industry, but ultimately we get to know the prospect and we learn their needs. And then from there, we place them in, on a platform that fits their needs and they get to work with our dedicated onboarding specialists to get um, do underwriting. So we have to go through an application and underwriting process and make sure we're following all the payment brand guidelines. Um, there's AML, there's KYC, there's OFAC. And ultimately, once there's an approval, the, the onboarding specialists and the their dedicated account executive work with them to get them up and running. And it's typically a five to 10 business day process, so not long at all. For them to get up and running right on um <clears throat> all right sounds good and what and, i mean how diverse is your is your product um your product skew i guess i mean because obviously i'm assuming that e-commerce is going to be different from a dispensary which would be possibly different from delivery well how diverse is is your offer we do anything from brick and mortar payments through a physical terminal okay. to payments connecting into the website it just depends on the industry and and the technology that they want. So it's a very unique onboarding process in terms of where the we want to be a, the extension of their payments team. We don't expect the farmers or the operators to know about payments and that's what we live and breathe. So we look at this as a partnership. They come on board and they have payment experts that can help guide them into the right place. And then any every time we update a product or launch something new, we let our customer base know if it's a better fit. But ultimately, you know, that's that's how we support the, the industry. And it's, it's every every conversation is different. I, that's why I love payments. And I I stay in this industry because it's been 15 plus years now and I still am learning something new every single right. day. So keep you on your toes. 
All right, excellent, excellent, excellent. That's great. So, what, um, what, so how involved? Well, okay, you say you're an extension of these people's sales, but how involved can you do your software to get into the sales process? I'm, I'm thinking of like data analytics on AI, um, sales and marketing funnels. Any? Did you provide any of that kind of information? We utilize AI and different funnels to be able to connect with dispensaries. We just um, chase on my team. He has done a great job on the marketing side and partnering or looking into different AI solutions. And we actually have one that is able to um, alert us if a dispensary is interested in our solutions. And then we can just call them right away and talk to them about our solutions instead of um, putting it on them to call us or email right. us, we're able to be proactive and reach out. So we definitely utilize all the technologies at hand um, to connect with our with our community. So right yeah, you need you need to find AI or figure out how like the, the people who are getting their their operations shut down because of payments and so on and so forth, and so that you know that you know they're going to be in need. <laughs> you know, I had to put some people in touch with some the other mm -hmm. day. Um, all right on so so what about so I, what 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 restrictions do you guys have on what and what you can offer um as far as payments in the cannabis space are you, are there any restrictions just because it's cannabis or or not so that's a that's a loaded question but i would say no. you know payments in the cannabis space aren't as simplified as they are in the cbd or right. psilocybin spore or you know, THC or peptide space, right? There's there's new okay. there's nuances and and all of these industries are considered high risk. Right. So every industry that we support is high risk. And again, going back to why we chose those industries is because we know they're very complicated um, in terms of finding the right solution, and we love to be able to find that for them. So they're all. W w there's restrictions in different ways, but we find a solution. If we can find the solution, we would we we have. And if there is a major restriction, you know, and we can't place that merchant, we let them know and keep them in our database until we can find a solution for them. I think the um, biggest opportunity right now and is or the biggest need right now is psilocybin payments. That okay, one, yeah, heard you so been, yeah, that one's been um you know very hard to it there isn't a solution right now in the industry that is compliant but it's something we're working to find you know every single day but otherwise there there's a there's a way to do everything um as long as you know we'll give everyone their flavor we'll give everyone their choice right. here are the different options you have right, which right works best for your business yeah Right All right. Okay. I well, then let's talk about the industry then. Back to cannabis and how the rescheduling. Um, where do you stand on that rescheduling, descheduling? What's your opinion? And then I'll just ask about it. This effect on your operations or potential again? I would prefer to be de you know completely descheduled. Um, I think all of us would. I think <laughs> of cannabis as a, a medicine. So so I I don't. You know, I would just love it to be federally legal, um, just like alcohol, for example, or CBD. So I, I don't think the reschedule versus deschedule is necessarily going to affect the payment business. What we're really looking forward to is potentially the Safer Banking Act to be passed. That's going to make a difference on, on the payment and financial side of the business. Um, but I would just love for cannabis to be seen in the same light as, as um, CBD. So that would, you know, and I know it'll happen one day. It'll get there, hopefully. Well, then, which which brings up another interesting interesting point where you have your CBD, hemp, and cannabis, and the battle that's um that's kind of brewing in Florida, with uh with the current governor um kind of putting a lot of support behind the hemp industry um in the hopes that they would help him in support of a no vote for the adult use cannabis in Florida. Um, yeah, what's, what's your take on that? You, you're kind of in between, because you obviously work with hemp and cannabis. Um, so you're going to have them like, they're probably going to come to you and say, oh, if you're working with them, you're, you're our enemy. And I don't know, how, how, how do you feel about that? I don't know. I, I, yeah, we're neutral because it's all, it's a flower <laughs> at the you know, right. it's a flower at the end of the day. Um, we don't discriminate over here on, on hemp versus cannabis. I, I know 
the fight, you know, I, I feel like that all boils down to more of a financial fight than anything, you know, um, THCA is you're able to sell that online. And the moment you light fire to THCA, it, it's essentially just like a cannabis plant. Right. And so there's, there's like that imbalance of opportunity there, but it is somewhat of a loophole. And you're, as long as you're, you know, following the rules and regs that are put in place, you can't knock them for it, but Absolutely. I think ultimately we we stay neutral because because we support both sides, and I I think you know it's all you know you know at the end of the day it comes from the same plant and is a medicine, so that's the way it's we all, look at it. It's all family. It's all I, I'm starting a campaign for Florida because I do think that. We need to kind of bring each other together, especially in these partisan times. You can't be making a plant partisan, and it is just no. It's just it's it needs to be appropriately counted. Um, I I think most definitely. But um, you mentioned in a, in our previous conversation that you could you could say a lot about Florida. What's what's your opinion of Florida? I mean, what's well, what's your what's your knowledge of the Florida market? I will start with that, or relationship. To so the, the Florida market. market on the cannabis side has a couple very large players typically you know multi-state operators so the majority of dispensaries in florida all trickle up to a handful of players on the cannabis side um so for us that we have relationships and we're talking to all of them but um one of the bigger payment options in cannabis is cashless atm um and one of the larger payment processors for cashless ATM is based in Florida. So the majority of that market utilizes that payment technology, breaking into that or breaking those customers away from that product isn't our intention, but it's also, they're also just, you know, set kind of set in their ways there. So we're, we're slowly showing them the benefits of other products. Um, so that's where the cannabis side of the Florida market in, in our mind is a couple very large players typically utilize cashless ATM and how do we provide value in that sense or, or show the value that we bring to the table to those operators. So that's one of those tortoise in the hair type right. industry or markets for us. And then on well, with the adult loose with adult use coming, well, potentially looming, what's, I mean, that could open up a lot of opportunities, don't you think? Even though it is kind of written that you know, the medical will still kind of dominate for at least the first six months. I mean, yeah, what do you, what do you think of that? So whether it's medical or recreational for us, we're indifferent, we can process payments in both. So if it becomes recreational, it's just going to grow the volume of whatever, you know, grow the volume of the market, you know, and, and the payment processors there can support it. So we would love to be part of the volume growth, that's for mm -hmm. sure, right. um, and enable those dispensaries to, you know, to process payments in a different way. Uh, so I would say that's great for the market. I think any market that's going to go recreational along with medical, it just shows that they're seeing cannabis in a different light, um, in a more broad light. So that's exciting. Um, right on. All right. Well, this, I mean, well, how, what, what, what are your best markets? What markets are you in? What, what are your best markets? And I guess, what was your strategy? Is it, is it, I, I do say like Florida is kind of is saturated with a, a specific, a specific company. I'm sure California is kind of the opposite. How does that, you know, how has that been for you guys? Well, we're, we're home, our home base or our headquarters is in Northern California, right in the Silicon Valley, the heart of the Silicon Valley. So, um, it's always great to be able to walk down the street and, and speak to your customer. I love that. So we are saturated. You know, we have a lot of customers in California, but we we cover the whole entire country. Um, any market that is, you know, medically or recreationally legal, we can support. Uh, so we we're spread we're spread out uh, in terms of the the markets. We have a a big a big customer base on the East Coast, specifically Massachusetts. We also have a large customer base in Michigan um, and California, but we, we have customers all over, which is great. Yeah. What about Maryland? Maryland, we are just starting to get into that market, which is yeah. great. Um, yeah, we're part of a couple of associations there and we're trickling into Maryland. Why do you bring Maryland up? I, I was just asking that for Marcus because that's that's where he is right now before he moves to Florida. So there he is. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just, okay. Just, there he is. Just, just, yeah. uh, just wondering. 
um what you yeah we because it maryland does seem like a pretty interesting market i will i do have to admit um it really really does so what else did they talk about okay i'm i'm, I'm running out of questions <laughs> sorry but, so anyway so what so um yeah, I guess well let, let's let's get into what well, let's get into the, the the market the everything that's kind of happened. There are a couple. I think there's even Pennsylvania. There are a couple of Texas cities that are that are looking at recreational. How did I mean? How does that shift? I mean, how when say when a state goes direct, does that make a big difference for you guys? I mean, does it open things up a lot, or is the slow rollout kind of not really? Are there even some restrictions maybe with the regulators? Because I know that like in and part I don't know in California, but I mean I know that with track and trace. Um, there's like one metric that's kind of the, the the standard, and the people trying to break that standard, but that is kind of the standard. Um, do you do you have like those kind of issues as well with, you know, just when you're getting when when markets do actually open up, with having any kind of restrictions? Yeah, we do, we don't. No, we don't have volume restrictions. That that would from a payment standpoint, that would the you know the only restriction I could see is just the growth and volume, and we don't have that. So. Right. Yeah, the, it, I, we're, we're happy to just for, support dispensaries no matter what, um, as long as it you know, fits their, their model and ours, we're, we're happy to do it. So no restrictions at all. What about state by state? Do the regulations, I mean, do they change dramatically um, as far as your, your operation? There are some states that have unique regulations uh, for, you know, for example, Utah, you have to go through a vetting process as a payment processor. Uh, Washington requires certain banks to be used. Right. So there are a couple states that have unique regulations that are written in by the state. Uh, that hasn't you know, been a problem for us per se, but we, we do notice that each state has, you know, most of them are very the same, but some have their nuances. And as we approach those states or, or work with uh, dispensaries or companies in those states, as long as we are following the regulations that the state provides, we're, we're good to go. And obviously we do that, but that's a good question from, from a payment processing standpoint, certain states have different regs. Also on an e-commerce standpoint, um, we need, you know, a lot of our, our customers, depending on the compliance of THCA, for example, right. our customers have to ensure that their shopping cart doesn't send that, you know, product to specific states. And so when we go through the onboarding process, we have to ensure that their shopping cart only lists the states where that particular product is legal to be sold. And so there is, um, you know, uh, an uplift or a technology we use to constantly vet those websites, not because we don't trust our customers, but because if there is one bad apple that comes into our ecosystem, it could cause an issue for the entire ecosystem. So it's just more more of those. We want to stay on the utmost compliance, and we want to we want to make sure, and we also advise all of our customers about that compliance as well. Right. So. Right. So will your customers consider to be strict? You're like, no, I can't get away with this. What's once is it? Or are you just like, nope, that's a no-no, and that's it. And so, so what's what happening? It's, it's not strict. It's that there, are so many of our customers are come to us because they've been shut down. Right. They've been it's shut okay, down right. because they partnered with solutions that weren't following the rules. Okay. It's not that we're strict. We just follow the rules. Follow the rules, right? We'll show mm -hmm. you how to follow the rules. Let me nice see. Mm -hmm. okay. I got you. Right. On. No. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Great. I think we can start kind of wrapping up there. Uh, we've got lots of lots of interesting information. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um. Um. We there is there is I don't I don't know if you heard. Uh, well, I'm sure you have heard, but there's this cannabis LAB cannabis lab conference coming up in October in in Florida. Um. Kind of just before the just before the November election. Um, we're kind of getting involved. Hopefully, we'll have some. I guess it will. It'll be. We'll have to do some level of embracing of hemp because I'm trying to push this campaign. We need to embrace each other. It has to go both ways. Um, but it, it might be something you might want to check out. Just a little uh, peer yeah, review presence down there. Lab. Yeah, yeah, we do. We actually have a new uh, uh, director of sales and operations out of Florida, Jacksonville. Yeah. So she's on her way actually to visit eight, the HQ this weekend and into next week. Um, she had a trouble, she had a lot of trouble getting here through the airlines, which is why I know that there's an issue. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, yeah. we are going to definitely represent Pay Rio in Florida and, right you know, in partnership with Rob and the Cannabis Lab. Right so. on, right on. Okay, cool. Right on. Yeah, I was, I, I yeah, 
I just met him this last week, I think. Um, very cool guy. We're definitely going to yeah. yeah, definitely get involved in that. That's going to be very, very cool. So, and hopefully to see you there as well. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, right on. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, great speaking to you. Thank you once again for your time. And thank you for joining us for another episode of the Cannabis and Coffee Conversations podcast brought to you by GandActivist.com magazine. Join us every Friday for a new episode.